Now, Ask Dr. Love with psychotherapist, author, love and relationship expert, Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and it's my pleasure to be with you again this week. So I have a question for you. Are you committing bedroom boo-boos? Well, in today's show, I'm pulling back the covers to reveal the seven most common male and female bedroom blunders and how to fix them fast, but not too fast, otherwise we'll be committing yet another blunder. Now, when it comes to female blunders, did you know that paying too much attention to his penis is high on the list of sexual screw-ups? And while we're on the subject, do you know the other six errors that most women make? Well, stay tuned. I'm going to lay them on you. And when it comes to guys, did you know that a really good way to rain on her sexual parade is to follow what I call the get-her-done approach, otherwise known as the Sex Olympics, which I rank top on the list of male bedroom boo-boos. So if you guys don't want her shouting boo at you in bed, you've got to stick around to find out more about this blunder and six other common male sexual blunders. So stick around and find out when it, whether it come, when it comes to getting laid, whether you're laying a very big egg or laying in clover. Okay, and a little later in the show, I'm going to lay some questions on you. The first one's in how is called How to Ask a Guy with Commitment Issues What He Wants. And here I'm helping out a young woman who's afraid to broach the subject for fear of hearing that she's, that he just wants to have fun. But at the same time, she doesn't want to burn her bridges by remaining exclusive with him if he's not interested in more. So stick around to find out my simple technique for handling this sticky subject. Second question I'm going to be answering is, he's texting a teen, a teen. And I'm helping out a woman whose 32-year-old boyfriend is texting a 14 year old and when she confronted him about it he just blew off her concern so stay with me to find out the real issue at stake and what she's got to do about it and the third question of the week is called messed up and here I'm working with a young woman who's tried everything to win a particular man's attention including giving him sex even when he was in a relationship with another person so stay with me to find out my shocking recommendations for her and then of course I can't miss reading between the sheets. And this week, I'm talking about the question called I'm Weak, where I'm helping out a 32-year-old man who says that he keeps losing partners because he can't manage a second inning. So stay with me to find out the real reason why all these women are putting him on the bench. Now, do you wish your sex life were different, better, hotter, Well, it's easy to blame your partner for not sending you to the moon and back in bed, but maybe it's not your partner's fault that your sex life isn't taking off because there are common mistakes that couples make that stop you from having a sex life that's off the charts. But don't worry, we can fix these mistakes. So let's start with the most common female sexual boo-boos. Now, the first female sexual boo-boo, I was about to say boob, (laughs) is waiting for him to get things going. Now, uh, it can become a habit. You know, he starts, you respond or not, and maybe you're frozen by the stereotype that guys make the first move or you dread being turned down. And I hear from a lot of men who say, I hate being the one who has to decide when and if we have sex. So what's the fix? Resolve to take the lead. If you're shy, start by flirting or planning a dinner out. And even if you won't have sex for a while, you'll set yourself up to have a very sexy moment. And don't be angry or hurt if he's too tired or stressed because women often take rejection to heart and guys tend to just figure they'll make an overture and have a one in three chance of being rejected. In other words, guys know rejection is par for the course. So ladies, you got to get your own balls (laughs) and don't be so wounded by rejection because sometimes guys are just too tired or not in the mood and it doesn't mean they don't love you or they're not attracted to you. Now, mistake two. Ignoring that guys are visual creatures. Now, there's a good reason why your guy is probably probably more likely to give you a gift like sexy lingerie than a handbag because he likes how you look in it a lot. And women tell me, but I find him hot in his old boxers. But women don't understand why he doesn't like her thermal chicken print pajamas. Well, the reason, according to research, is that men respond most to visual stimulation while women tend to use touch, sound, smell, words, and emotion to get turned on. That's what research shows us. So the fix. You ladies want to ditch your grungy underwear, the long johns and the, you know, the ugly uh, pajamas with holes. At least ditch it some nights. And you don't have to wear lace or dominatrix gear. It's, um, if that's not your style, but 
You'll do both you and your partner a favor if you pick some bed clothes that show off your body and make you feel sexy. Okay? Mistake three that women make, bedroom boo-boo number three, having unreal ideas about how your own body works. So don't believe that real women have vaginal orgasms or thanks um, to porn and uh, Sex in the City episodes that female ejaculation or squirting is the norm because it's not. Women are convinced that uh, it will enhance their experience, but only 5 to 6% of women actually squirt, and you can damage pelvic floor muscles trying. And again, I think that the research now shows that only, uh, it's more than half women, half of the women, or two-thirds of the women, don't even have vaginal orgasms. And here's your fix. Relax, and trying to climax in a certain way only puts you on edge. So most women do need clitoral stimulation for orgasm because the clitoris is rich with nerves. Grinding against your partner, oral sex, or hand stimulation can do the job. So a nice stretch of foreplay helps most women climax. And also, by the way, masturbating is the best way for you to climax with a partner because when you know what works for you, you can take your show on the road and tell your partner. All right. Bedroom blunder four for women. Overthinking. I call this the Sex Olympics and other forms of spectatoring. You know, spectatoring being your sort of outside your event, watching the event. That's the Sex Olympics. So say you worry about taking too long to climax or you're carefully acting out a scene from uh, Fifty Shades of Grey or you avoid a position that makes your, your stomach jiggle. Well, if you think about how you act rather than how you feel, you're an actor, you're a spectator rather than a lover. Now, you probably heard of the sex researchers Masters and Johnson. Well, they are the ones who called this self-monitoring spectatoring. And research shows that women who do spectator have fewer orgasms and they fake it more. So what's the fix for this? Bring your focus back to something about the present, the feel of your partner's skin, the look on his face, how much you like feeling him inside you. Learning mindfulness meditation can actually help you to do this. So now you go join the yoga class and say, check it out, I want to be mindful so I can be more present to sex. That's a big part of it. Now, here's female boo-boo number five. Over-focusing on his penis. So, yeah, lot, guys like to have their penises touched, but men like women to focus on other areas, too, in order to build their desire. And too often, guys will say, women focus right away and only on, on my penis, and that gets them down. So the fix, start somewhere else. Neck a while, give a massage, play with his nipples, rub his scrotum. The whole body likes foreplay, all right? Bedroom boo-boo number six for women under focusing on yourself so you tease him you please him you make his dreams come true but what about you what are you chopped liver what do you like want and what do you fantasize about because you're not getting a good time if you're thinking i wish he'd move a millimeter to the left because you're in your head again and you're not being in the moment and you're not being in your own body so what's the fix for this speak up Better to say, a little higher, a little lower, that's great. Hold it right there. Remember the movie uh, Funny Girl where he, she's being seduced in uh, this private, private room and she starts singing, um, a little higher, dear. Yeah. <laughs> so a woman's body is complex and just know that a guy can't know everything about you unless you tell him and every woman's wired differently. So now let's go on to the most common male bedroom boo-boos, okay? Now, you know how most guys learn about sex, right? You're taught the basic facts of life, and then you're left to puzzle out your partner's sexuality in your own by trial and error. Now, obviously, experience is useful, but it isn't everything, because guys who've had a lot of sexual experience with women still make mistakes. So you don't have to learn the hard way, if you'll pardon the pun. There are three well-known sex ed educators who will tell you um, tell you, um, and I'm, I guess we'll have to say I'm one of them, that um, the most common sex mistakes that men make and uh, with women. So the first one is um, assuming that you know how to please a woman. Well, this macho attitude gets men into so much trouble because some men assume that the way they've learned to please one woman works for another, and this is not so. You've got to remember with each sexual partner you have, you gain a growing body of knowledge of females' bodies and female pleasure, but women's sexuality is complicated and it's really individual, and every woman responds in different ways 
to sensation. And every woman's anatomy is a little different. And what feels amazing to one may do nothing or even cause discomfort for another. So you need to do a little sexual detective work. And to be a sexual Sherlock Holmes, or maybe I should say a Sherlock Holmes, right? With each new partner to discover your partner's unique sexual fingerprint. So when it comes to intercourse, one key variety is your thrusting technique. Does she like it fast or slow, deep or shallow, or does she like to mix it up, slow and shallow at first and then fast and deep? And also, remember, no one sex position is every woman's favorite cup of tea. So she may prefer a certain sex position for several reasons. And different positions allow various angles of penetration, depending not only on her anatomy, but also the size and shape of your penis. So differences between partner's body shape and height may make some positions better than others. And for some women, it's important to have face-to-face -face intimacy during intercourse. Now, I talk to a lot of women who say, I know missionary gets a bad rap, but I really like it. And others say, it's got to be from behind. So people are really, really across the board when it comes to positions. All right. Now, mistake two that guys make, bedroom boo-boo number two. Let's not talk about sex. Now, most couples who seek counseling don't talk to each other about sex, and that's because they don't have the words because many people don't know or aren't comfortable using correct terms. So, for example, a guy might say vagina when he means the vulva, and he might talk about doing it, though it's not always clear what it is, vaginal intercourse, oral sex, and a lot of work is done initially just getting comfortable with the words. So it's hard for your partner to say what she wants sexually. Trying, try If it's hard for your partner to say what she wants sexually, Try asking specific open-ended questions like, what do you like? That's um, too open-ended, and that doesn't usually get you where you want. So to get around this sticking point, one thing that you could do is to say, which do you like better? Well, that's like a multiple choice question, and then they have to write a, an essay. So just say, do you like this better or that? Pick A or B. Now, many men also think that they should keep quiet during sex, and usually that's not a good thing because we don't want to have sex with Marcel Marceau, you know, the mime. So there are far too many people having sex in silence in America and beyond, and that's like having sex with a mime, like I said. So couples should give each other verbal cues during sex. Talk to each other and ask each other what you want, and a good way to go is to use neutral prompts like harder, slower, or right there. And same as directors, um, you'll give someone... The same as the directions you would give someone who's scratching your back. Yeah, a little higher, a little lower. So give really basic, clear information. And you don't have to be a master of what they call dirty talk. But dirty talk could be fun, too, if everyone's on the same page about it. But if you don't like talking dirty, you can talk sexy without being lewd. So telling her what... Um, what you want could be highly arousing and get great results. But say, I want you, not want, not I want it. Uh, that's the secret. You don't want her to feel like an object or a, a hole. So don't hold back moans, grunts, or sighs either. Sounds of sex are sexy, and they are a big turn on. All right, here's bedroom boo-boo number three for guys. Taking it out of context. Now, often guys forget that sex doesn't happen in a vacuum. A man may wonder why he's unhappy with the sex he's having and not connect that... Um, the how his partner and he are getting along is the key. So a woman may not open up sexually with a partner if she doesn't feel safe emotionally with him, and this is a big key. So for many women, it takes a feeling of being vulnerable to let themselves be explored. And your re recent behavior, guys, follows you into the bed with a woman too because she's still thinking about how you've been the week before, the day before, the hour before. So poor foreplay, not poor play, right? Foreplay begins the week before when you take out the trash. Now, guys can be clueless about timing, so very often I hear women complaining that my partner tries to initiate sex at the absolute wrong times, and that's an easy fix. There's an easy fix for that, so people let us know what they want all the time, and just pay attention, and a woman may literally tell you that she wants to, what she wants to do at various times of the day, and if she doesn't mention sex, that might be a cue for you to wait. And men have to also remember that most women need more time than men to become aroused. Guys can become aroused by a stiff wind and then be on their way. But for many women, the right time for sex would be when she wants it and isn't rushed. All right, let me take a brief break and I'll come back to you on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Hello again, and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I'm talking today about bedroom boo-boos. And I was up to number four, I think, with guys, but you know, this is the time in the show for Dr. Love's quickie. So let me give you the quickie, and then we can come back to the bedroom boo-boos. So first of all, let me just tell you a little tip of the week. Uh, research shows that the average guy lasts about 14 minutes 
during intercourse. But you don't necessarily have to go that long to satisfy a woman because the minimum duration of sex, including seduction, foreplay, and intercourse, should be about 30 minutes all told. And anything under half an hour is not satisfying to a woman. So if you're not quite there yet, build up your sexual stamina by aiming to make each sexual encounter um, a few minutes longer than the one before. And for every 30 minutes of sex, only one quarter to one third of the time has to be spent on actual intercourse. And this leaves plenty of time for other things that women like, and that way you won't feel as if your penis is being clocked. We don't want to put a clock on your penis. Now, let me, let me run by you this um, really uh, interesting WebMD quiz that I saw, and it was the secret bedroom fears of men. So I'm just going to share the quiz with you and you can sort of take it right along with me. The first one, the first question that they asked was, um, m men think this, women don't like chest hair. And what do you think the answer is? Is that true or false? Turns out the answer is false, that that is not true, right? Because some women do, some don't. So it's not, it's not across the board true. Even though we see movie stars that have no hair, lots of women like guys with hair. Now here's the second bedroom fear for guys. Size of the penis matters. Is that true or false? Guess what? False. Only 1% of the women surveyed said it's important. 20% rated it important, but more than half said it didn't matter at all. So throw the ruler away. The third fear that guys have, the average length of an erect penis. They're afraid their penises are too small. Well, guess what? The average erect penis is only between 5 and 6 inches. And flaccid, it's only 3.5. So relax. You're probably in the norm. And besides, it's not the size of the wave. It's the motion of the ocean. Remember that. Number four guy fear. A woman's satisfaction is related to whether the partner brings her to orgasm. True or false? Guess what? False. Studies show that many women do not mention orgasm when they're asked about their most satisfying sexual experiences. Instead, they talk about feeling loved, passionate, happy, aroused, erotic, and connected to their partner. So that takes you out of, out of the hot seat. Number five, couples enjoy sex less when a condom is used. True or false? Guess what? False. All the people studied didn't say, said that it didn't affect whether or not they had an orgasm. So lay on the condoms. Number six, the percentage of men aged 50 to 59 who didn't have sex in the last year. How much? 21 percent. Um, uh, and the percentage goes higher to up to 34 percent of married men in their 60s and 54 percent of those in their 70s. So if you're not having it as much as you want, don't think that you're the only one. It's more common than you think. Seven, how long do men typically take to reach an orgasm? Five minutes. That was the average in a study of 500 couples in the U.S. and other countries, four other countries. Eight, um, what may help a man who has trouble delaying orgasm? Medication, condoms, more frequent sex, using a condom, all of the above. And also the squeeze technique. I fully outlined that on my website. Just put it in my archives and you'll find, I didn't mean that, put it in. Go into my archives and you'll find out about the squeeze technique. Now, number nine, most men have erection problems at some point in their lives. True or false? True. 52% of men will experience erectile function at some point. Ten, not reaching or sustaining an erection should be treated if it happens. If it happens. Well, that is true if it's consistent over three months. Here's the next one. Men with erectile problems should avoid drinking. True or false? False. There's no link between moderate drinking and ED. But older guys are more affected by alcohol. And here's the last one. As men age, they may need more stimulation to achieve orgasm. True or false? Oh, yes. That's a whopping true. Lower testosterone, side effects of drugs, other health problems, um, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, less blood flow to the penis. This can actually be a symptom. So, however, there's no age limit on having a sex, satisfying sex life, even if it takes longer to have an erection or you don't get an erection. All right? Let me give you some tweets here. So, overthinking creates a sex life that's stinking. <laughs> Put your head to bed for a better time in bed. And to be a sexual Venus, remember he has other bodily parts besides his penis. And don't be shoddy. Take time to discover your partner's body. And for a good sexual time, don't be silent as a mime. Your partner needs to be led to know what turns you on in bed. Don't sell your sex life short by turning the act into an Olympic sport. And sex is not a spectator sport. Elation requires your full participation. 
And to be a good fornicator, you can't be a spectator. <laughs> sex goes slack when we try to observe ourselves in the sack. And last but not least, stop worrying about the outcome and you'll find it easier to come. All right, I'm going to take a brief break and I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Hello again and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf and I'm talking today about bedroom boo-boos. And I was up to mistake number four, the mistakes that guys make. And here's the one I talked about at the beginning of the show, the get her done mindset. Men tend to think of sex like a mission. They break it down into steps, erection, foreplay, penetration. It's all aimed at achieving the main objective, orgasm. And this is a big mistake for a couple of reasons. One is that the whole world of sensual experience exists beyond the genitals. Our entire body is erotic. Look at the whole body as a map, conquer all the territory. I know women who can have an orgasm from having their nipples played with, and there are women who love to kiss and make out, and all of that is part of sex. And another reason why it's a mistake to focus solely on orgasm is sometimes it doesn't happen, even for men. And at those times, people can end up feeling bad about sex that may have been good in other ways. And some men get upset if they can't give a woman an orgasm. And I hear from women a lot of the time that they're already putting pressure on themselves to have an orgasm and there's an added layer from their partner. And the woman may say it's okay that they still enjoy sex without an orgasm, as I said just before the break. And they don't need to have an orgasm every time. But guys many times don't believe their female partners because they're locked into this goal-oriented mindset and their attitude is, get that orgasm done. And sex should be thought of as a circular process, like a merry-go-round that you can step on and off of whenever you want. <laughs> and there's no goal. There's no such thing as not finishing or fail at failure. So we get on and we get off the merry-go-round merry -round. at any point. We don't worry about getting off. The getting off. <laughs> getting off. We can get off the merry ground, but not getting off. Now, here's my guy mistake, bedroom boo-boo five. I'm all she needs. Now, many women are interested in using or have used sex toys. And sex toys represent a place where a guy's ego can really get in the way and be bruised way too easily. So a man may feel threatened by a woman's use of sex, to sex toys if he believes his own body parts should be enough to satisfy her. And men who reject sex toys walk away from a really big opportunity to broaden their partner's pleasure. So a vibrator can deliver focused, consistent, intense stimulation that's impossible for a human hand, mouth, tongue, penis to provide. And many women actually need that kind of stimulation to have an orgasm. And that's okay. It doesn't mean she's broken. It doesn't mean she's strange. It doesn't mean your tongue, hands, fingers, or penis are defective. So bringing toys into sex play and making toys a couple activity is a really new paradigm. And there are sex toys that can stimulate both partners at the same time. Embrace it. Get used to it. Go along with the ride. Literally. Now, mistake six. Ringing the doorbell. So most guys have a general idea of what the clitoris is and where to find it, but many don't know all there is to it. The clitoris is not only this tiny button on the outside of the body, which is what most people think it is, but um, it's really more like a wishbone shaped organ that is largely internal. So the gland of the clitoris is the button that you can see peeking out from the clitoral hood and that's at the 12 o'clock position on the vulva. But the body of the clitoris extends under the clitoral hood and then bends back and branches into two legs behind the labia. And below the legs are two bulbs of tissue that surround the urethra and the vagina. The entire clitoris is tissue that, like a man's penis, swells with blood when a woman becomes aroused. And the whole body of the clitoris, not just the gland, is packed with nerves and highly sensitive. And for many women, the gland is actually too sensitive to touch. And plenty of women don't want stimulation directly on the gland. It's like you're ringing a doorbell. And instead, they prefer stimulation on the internal body of the clitoris. And other women prefer indirect pressure or vibration that stimulates the clitoris through other areas of the vulva. The majority of women need some clitoral stimulation to have an orgasm. And most women are not able to have an orgasm by vaginal sex alone. 
and penile vaginal sex is an inefficient means of producing a female orgasm. That's what any engineer would tell you. And it actually makes sense because we're made for procreation. So when a woman has an orgasm in intercourse, the contractions cause us to expel the semen, which is um, counterproductive for holding the semen in for procreation. So that's why the clitoris was put far away from the vagina. It, it's, it's not a naturally intuitive thing. Now, bedroom boo-boo number seven for guys, compare and despair. Now, many guys have unrealistic beliefs about how often they should be having sex based on what they believe other people are doing. And this can make guys feel bad about themselves and unhappy in their relationship because they compare themselves to their peers and they're convinced that everyone around them is screwing like bunnies, having more sex and better sex than they are, and it's just not true. Remember the statistic I quoted during my quickie segment, high percentages of couples aren't having sex at all. In, you know, on, from month to month. Now, how often men have sex varies greatly by their age and relationship status, according to a national survey published in 2010 in the Journal of Sexual Medicine. And that survey shows differences based on whether men were single, married, or had a long-term relationship other than marriage. And age also matters. For instance, married men tend to have sex less often every decade after 30. But that doesn't mean that their sex lives got worse as they got older. How often you have sex may have little to do with how satisfied you are sexually. Because people say we have sex a lot or we only have a little. But when we probe further, what we find out constitutes a lot or a little is wildly different. And what you consider a lot or a little can change over time. And having sex twice a week might seem like a lot to you when you're single and not so much when you're a newlywed. And if you have kids and have been with your partner for a decade or more, it might seem like a lot again. So you need to change your expectations and re frame how you think about frequency and you got to acknowledge that people will change the dynamic changes and be okay with that alrighty well that was a mouthful now let me go on to some questions this one is called how to ask a guy with commitment issues what he wants now here's the question I've been seeing a guy for three months now he lives in another country though. So it's not like we see each other every day. He's here for work regularly. I'm 25, he's 36. I've had commitment issues in the past and never had a serious relationship. But I don't have these issues anymore. I really like this guy and I want to know where he's at. I get attention when I'm in a bar by myself and I turn every guy down because I only want to be with him. But if he's sure that he doesn't want our relationship to develop into something more, then I don't want to miss out on other experiences and maybe miss the opportunity of meeting a really nice guy. But he gets scared very easily and I don't know how to ask how he feels. I'm afraid that if he wants to run and say I don't want to be officially boyfriend and girlfriend now as I think that's too soon and we need to get to know each other better. So I want to know if our relationship now is just casual and fun for him while he's here or if it can develop into more. So um, please help me, Dr. Love. Okay, so your question is very, very clear to me. So first of all, I get that you're reluctant to be direct with him because you're afraid to scare him off. I get that. And your fear that he's going to tell you that he doesn't want to be officially termed boyfriend, girlfriend is something to pay attention to because if you're getting that vibe, there's a good chance that you're picking up where he's coming from. And the best thing to do is to just confirm that you're right. And you can easily do this by lightly saying, I'm getting the sense that you aren't interested in forming a serious relationship and that you would just like to have fun and nothing more. Am I right? Now, the cool thing about doing that is you're just reflecting back the vibe you're getting from him and you're checking. You're not putting pressure on him. You're just checking. Sit back and see what he says. Now, if he says, yeah, I only want fun, then you know what you've got and that you need to keep dating other guys. Now, if he says directly that he's not ready to be exclusive, then you can directly let him know that you'll be dating other guys or you can just go out with other guys. And above all, you have to take care of yourself and keep your eye on the ball. And that's your ball, not the other way around, because it's not fair to yourself to close down your options and behave as though you're in an exclusive relationship when he isn't on the same page as you. And a lot of women make this mistake because women, for women, think about our anatomy. You're taking somebody inside your body. 
It's a, it's a more intimate act to do this than for a guy whose penis is outside his body. More easy for him to be more neutral about intercourse. So a lot of women think, well, if we're having sex, we will develop a relationship. He will develop intimacy. He will develop attachment. But that isn't necessarily the case because guys are able to compartmentalize their penises and just uh, clean the pipes and not become as attached as you may be uh, growing attached. So be aware of that. And don't use um, sex as a, as a hook to try to bring a guy into a relationship and a commitment because it doesn't work. All right. Here's the next question. He's texting a teen. Hello, I need help, Dr. Love. I've been with my boyfriend for 10 months now, and I found out this week that he's been texting a 14-year-old. He's 32 years old. I know that this is very wrong. He says I'm over-exaggerating and that even though he has a girlfriend, it wouldn't stop him from talking to people, even though, um, he, even though he wouldn't. I'm very confused. I tried talking to him, but he doesn't listen. Now, every time he's on his phone, I think he's texting other people. Am I overreacting? I'm really lost with all this. Help me, please. Okay, so the first off, this guy's dismissing your feelings because if you're upset, he should be interested in understanding why and doing what he can to make you feel better. That's what we do when we love each other. We are considerate of each other's feelings. Now, your red flags are flapping for a reason. You have more than one problem here with this guy. First off, you have a guy with wandering eyes and fingers. And what's, what's a 32-year-old man doing texting a 14-year-old girl? I mean, come on, let's be real here. I'm sure he's not texting her to discuss her homework. His behavior borders on pedophilia. Now, the fact that he's communicating with young girls is already a huge concern. But even if the girl weren't underage, you have the second issue relating to the fact that he's flirting with other people and denying it. So his behavior isn't serious. It isn't trustworthy. He's not being honest about his actions. Plus, the fact that he dismisses you is downright obnoxious and hostile. Now, the real issue we need to discuss isn't his problem. It's yours. Because the fact that you haven't already taken a hike tells me that you don't love and respect yourself as you should. Because I am sure that if you did a little honest soul searching, you would realize that you are playing out an old scar from your own childhood. And I'm betting that one or both of your parents didn't give you the proper attention. Perhaps they even favored one of your siblings over you. Or perhaps you watched one of your parents cheating on the other. Now, if you didn't have the old scar that I suspect you do, you wouldn't be with this man. Because remember, we choose partners who repeat our worst childhood traumas. And we do this hoping to achieve what I call our happy ending, which is the resolution of the original injury. So if your parent ignored you and favored a younger sibling, you would be drawn to a partner who doesn't pay you the right attention and favors a younger girl. See the parallel here? Now, you aren't going to achieve a happy ending with this man. I say this because he's not interested in hearing what you're saying. He's not interested in being responsive. And the bottom line is, staying with him means reliving the pain of your past and re-injuring yourself. So I encourage you to identify and heal your old scar. My new book, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, will help you to do just this because I have a whole chapter that I call Battle Scars. And in that chapter, I list every kind of relationship conflict that we find ourselves in. And then I help you decipher what the old scar is that draws us to this kind of partner and this kind of relationship problem. And then I show you how to heal. Now, um, ideally, we would use the relationship to work together to mutually heal each other's old scars. But in, a case, um, uh, in the case of this man, I don't see him being interested at all in helping you heal. So we would use this chapter in my book to help you identify your old scar and then you go on to heal it yourself and free yourself because you deserve much better. You deserve a guy who's just all there for you and that's how it's supposed to do to be done. Now, when you do the healing I suggest, uh, you are going to free yourself for a much healthier love because what's going to happen is you will never think twice about a man like this. You will stop choosing these kinds of broken winged birds who hurt you and replay your past and cause you pain because you're going to be free of the past so you won't need to keep repeating it. Then you'll be able to move on to a healthier relationship with somebody who is all there for you and that's what I want for you. All right, my friend? So read the book and get back to me and let me know how well you're doing. All right, I'm going to take a brief break and I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio.
Hello again, and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and I am enjoying being with you again today. I'm talking at this time in the show about the questions that are coming in, and the next one up on, on the lineup is called Messed Up. So here it is. Hi, Dr. Love. I'm going to try to make this short. I started seeing a guy four years ago, and then he had a girlfriend, so he just had me for sex. But I really fell hard for this guy and did all kinds of crazy stuff to make him like me. And then his girlfriend found out that he was seeing me behind her back, and she broke up with him. And after that, we talked almost constantly for four years, and he has seen, we have seen each other at parties and stuff. But he has still just played me all along. But this spring, something happened, and he really seemed into me. Finally, and he said stuff he never said before and that he was falling for me. So we got together a couple of times, and then out of the blue, he texted me and said that we're better off as friends, and I just said, fine. But this weekend, I was on a, at a party where he was, and I totally got crazy yelling at him, and he can't treat me this way and stuff like that. And the stupid thing is that I really, really love him, and I want him so bad. And I think that he likes me, too, because why would he text me and see me for four years without feeling a thing? So please, what should I do to get him back? Please help me. Oh boy. So listen, my heart really, really bled when I read your letter. Because you said that the guy played you all along. But the sad fact is, you allowed him to do so. And from the start, you have not treated yourself with respect. You allowed him you allowed this guy to use you for sex, all the while knowing that he had a girlfriend. And then you did all kinds of crazy things to make him love you. And of course, all your efforts didn't work, like I said a few minutes ago. Sex doesn't make a man fall in love with you. And especially if you're degrading yourself. Because when a woman degrades herself the way you have, it makes her come off as desperate and needy, which doesn't inspire love. So remember, we're all hardwired to seek out mates who are the most desirable and most attractive to ensure the healthiest offspring. This is just a biological programming in all of us. So when a woman chases, begs, and gives it up too easily, she just seems hungry and needy, which is the opposite of desirable and attractive. Now, if you want this man, you have to first fall in love with yourself. In my book, Make Up, Don't Break Up, I have an entire chapter that's going to guide you step by step on how to raise what I call your personal net worth. When you feel better about yourself, you're gonna, this is going to lead you to naturally convey the right signals to him, signals that tell him you are desirable and attractive. But this isn't about playing games. It's about loving yourself more than you love him. It's about feeling in your bones that no matter how much you love this guy, you're not going to beg plead, chase, or give him sex to try to win him away from another woman. When you feel this way about yourself, he'll start chasing you if he truly has feelings for you and if he's truly capable of a relationship and intimacy. Now, the only way for you to find out if his feelings are real is for you to do the self-work that I have outlined and improve your self-esteem. When you feel great about yourself and you stop over-functioning, you're going to naturally exude the attractive energy that's going to make men start pursuing you right and left. And he's going to know that men are after you. And then it'll be his job to step up to the plate and woo you and win you. That's how it's supposed to be. Men are wired to be chasers and hunters. All right? So first, love yourself. And then the rest is history. And I want to hear from you. I want you to take better care. All right. Now... Let me do a reading between the sheets question for you. All right, ready? So here it is. Hi, doctor. I'm 32 years old and I've been having sexual weakness for more than six years and I find it difficult to make two rounds and it's made me lose my female friends. Please help me. And thanks from Maurice, I'm waiting. Okay, so first of all, I don't like you saying that you're weak because just saying that is enough to get your little head down, seriously. It's hanging its head in shame. Now, every guy has what we call a refractory period. This refers to the length of time it takes for the body to recover and obtain another erection. The refractory period can be as little as 20 minutes and as much as a week. And as men age, the refractory period gets longer. Now, even if you can't get an erection again for some time, you still have two hands and one mouth. So there's no reason why you couldn't give your partners pleasure in other ways. And you're far more than your penis, dude. If your partner absolutely feels the need to be penetrated again, you could use a dildo or a vibrator. But there's a bigger issue here. When you call yourself names and you put yourself down, you're sending out a message to your partners that says, I'm inadequate, I'm no good, 
and sending out this message is like putting a negative thought in their minds. If you feel weak and inadequate, they will think the same of you. It's just an energetic thought transmission, and it, it happens. People don't understand how true this is, like how our thoughts have energetic wings. You know, when you're parked at a, at a green light, and you, you're parked at a red light, at a stop sign or something and you turn over and you you turn to the right and you look at the driver in the next car haven't you ever noticed that the driver invariably turns and looks back at you well that person is feeling the energetic frequency of your gaze you think you're weak you and you're inadequate they feel the energetic frequency of your thinking and if on the contrary if you feel comfortable in your own skin foreskin included other women will be comfortable with you too so who are we kidding here? No woman in her right mind is going to dump a man because he can't get it up again immediately. Because think of all the women who stay with men who can't get it up at all. So if you feel comfortable with the way your body works, so will your partners. And any woman who would leave a man because he can't get another erection immediately isn't the kind of woman you want anyway. So first accept yourself and your plumbing. And when you do, you're going to attract a woman who accepts you too. All right? So it looks like I have a few more minutes, so uh, let me lay another question on you, all right? So uh, what is the right move? Uh, hi, Dr. Love, it's me again. I'm the 18-year-old who has issues with physicality. I was in this rain for a year and a half, and I ended it because I realized he doesn't care. He would talk to another girl a lot. They didn't do anything, but I can't know for sure, and hide it from me saying it just slipped his mind. I haven't met anyone from his life like no one. No best friends when they were in town, not parents, not random college friends. We're in college now, separate ones. He says he tried with a few, um, and his friend says that they don't want to meet me. So apparently no one wants to meet me, even though, even though they don't know me. And he would lie to me about his academics, too. So even though he has stopped talking to the girl now since three months of me crying my eyes out and being sad over this. It doesn't matter because he just doesn't talk to anyone anymore, or so he says. I don't know for sure. How can I? I know no one from his world. He has just become so weird and tells me I'm the only person he talks to. So I just can't trust him anymore. And besides, doing all this crap and taking me for granted all the time, he admitted so after I kept repeatedly telling him and um, rationality touched, he tells me he cares and that I'm not understanding and how do I get over this? He reacts like a tsunami has struck when I talk to another guy. He just is always insecure because these two guys I talk to like me, and when I say I'll stop talking to them or talk less, I get, oh, you'll find another one. I'm not that type of girl at all. He makes me sound like one who only likes male company, which couldn't be farther from the truth. He just said he's sorry for uh, reacting and won't say a word to me now, even if it bothers him to death. And I never prioritized anyone above him, but he did with that girl. So I feel so betrayed and hurt all the time that I'm with him, and I don't see any truth in him anymore. And the worst part is that he's told me to give him a last chance 101 times, and I did, and he always screwed up. So finally I decided to draw the line. I saw that there isn't a person who's trying. There's just a person making barely any effort hoping that I'm going to change and adjust with to his nonchalant character and I think I'm right so I ended it and he says that he'll still make an effort and it was just the same uncaring behavior within a few days and every time I point out the mistake it starts with I'm sorry it won't ha happen again and it ends with you keep finding fault let the past go and things will get better so how can I let go of the past when I've been so hurt I'm not stupid that I forget everything and start afresh knowing this person has a history of not maintaining promises ever so should I move on completely I think I could manage that and I won't be able to trust him again for sure but I know that he's going to keep saying that he cares, even though he doesn't, do everything to show even the slightest concern and worsen his everyone leaves. And, and I'm just going to worsen his everyone leaves issue. So what should I do to minimize the pain? I think I feel much more pain than he does. He sounds pretty chilled out most of the time and puts on the I have so much work voice to me often. At least that's what I'm thinking. All right. So listen, this guy is absolutely not responsive to you. And the fact that you're even asking yourself and questioning tells me that you have an old scar. Because let me lay this out for you. Old scars uh, cause something called the repetition compulsion. The repetition compulsion is literally like a compulsion inside us to pick a partner 
who resembles the parent who let us down. And then we have a compulsion to try to fix the partner. And we can't seem to let go of the partner, no matter, even though our intellect says, as your intellect says, the guy's no good, he doesn't change, he says, I'm sorry, but he never comes, you know, he never comes around, he still flirts with other women, he doesn't give me proper attention. So even knowing all this in your head and knowing you'll never trust him, that old scar brings this compulsion to us of, I can't give up trying to change this person. This time it's going to be different. If only I just hang in the ring and I'm even better and more giving and more patient, he will finally change. Now, the idea of giving up a partner who's not meeting your needs is just unbearable to us. Why? Because the compulsion to stay in the ring and fix it makes us also think, well, if I give this person up, I will never, never have a hope in hell of ever healing my original old scar because that's why we, re we repeat the original scar hoping that we're going to fix what went wrong with our parents and when we do we're going to feel like the original scar was healed. So in this case because you keep staying it's because you don't want to feel the pain you would have to feel of giving up all hope of changing him. So when you let go of the repetition compulsion you have to go through a period of grieving this is part of the growth. Like I had a patient who kept on picking guys who abandoned her, threw her overboard for other women. Uh, not just flirted, but threw her overboard. And she was so depressed from this compulsion that she had to keep picking guys like this and trying to fix them and staying and being re-injured. She was so depressed she tried to kill herself. So she comes to me for therapy after having tried to kill herself. And the first thing I said was, no more dating, no more relationships till we identify and heal the wound. So what we found her wound to be was um, her own mom threw her off of her lap when she was only a baby because mom had another baby. So aha, she kept picking guys who would throw her overboard, right? And staying with them hoping to fix it. Now, why do we stay hoping to fix it? To understand this, you got to understand the way the baby brain works and most of us haven't outgrown this aspect of the baby brain. Babies think that they are the center of the universe. So whatever happens to us is because of us it's our fault. So if mom throws me overboard it's because I'm not lovable. And baby brains also are omnipotent. I have the power to fly, to fix things. Whatever happens I can fix. If mom throws me overboard I can make her stick by me and love me. And so those two things, the center of the universe and the omnipotent thinking is what makes us say, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to fix him. I'm going to keep trying. And when we accept that we didn't make the person's problem, we can't fix it. We don't have this power. Then we let go of the reins and there's an incredible freedom. And this patient that I was telling you about, when she let go of the reins, she went through a grieving process. She accepted, I'll never be able to rewrite my childhood and fix what happened with my mother. And I'm not going to try to do it anymore with boyfriends who keep hurting me. And she grieved the loss. That was a fact. But what happened after the grieving was like Phoenix, Phoenix rising from the ashes. She came out a new and a healed woman. She no longer was drawn to these kinds of abandoning men. She went on to find the love of her life, got married, and lived happily ever after. So my long story short to you is find out what your old scar is and heal it. That's going to free you up from this repetition compulsion and you're not going to want to be with this guy anymore. You're not going to be driven by this fantasy of I'm going to fix him. Yes, you will grieve, but you will be free. All right? And get in touch with me. I'll show you, I show you exactly how to do all this healing step by step in Kiss Your Fights Goodbye. So get on it and get busy healing so that you can get busy loving. Loving yourself first and then loving the right partner. All right, so that's all I have for you this week. Now, also, I'm going to be sending out an email if it hasn't already gone out, if my webmaster hasn't sent it. Tomorrow, I'm doing a Google Hangouts on Kiss Your Fights Goodbye. But what is so cool about Google Hangouts, it's like a live radio and a live TV show that's broadcasting over, um, over, over YouTube. So you can watch, you can call in, you can join, you can text me a question, you can listen on your phone. So it's a total multimedia experience. So I hope everybody will tune in so I can actually get to talk to you live there too. All righty. So I will see you next week on Ask Dr. Love Radio and Mind Those Bedroom Boo-Boos. <laughs>